Hey everybody, welcome back to FRM 120. Uh, we are getting into the third phase of our lesson two, talking about the fundamentals of electricity. We've got a lot more to cover, but this will be the third installment for lesson two that we will get into in terms of, we've talked about terminology, we've talked about uh, you know, the, the, uh, the voltage, we've talked about current resistance, we've talked about uh, a lot of different things, conductors and power sources and things like that. So we're gonna kind of start putting this all together here shortly, but just a quick review. We left off where we were talking about Ohm's law, okay? And Ohm's law will help us calculate what is missing in our circuit here, where we have voltage, current, or resistance, okay? It gives us an, uh, an opportunity to mathematically compute whatever it is we're missing in our, in our circuit as far as the values. And so, going back, if we were to apply 240 volts, which you probably have at your house, uh, you should have, at 240 volts, you will apply that voltage to this coil of wire. That resistance will cause that to heat up, and it will then heat the water. But uh, we are we we are expecting this um, this uh, heating coil to pull about 20 amps. Okay, we all know what amps is now. It should by now. Okay, we've got 20 amps, and so if we divide, but going by Ohm's law, if we divide our voltage by our amperage, we should expect the um, the uh, the um, heat coil to uh, read about 12 ohms. And again, we take our meter and we simply put it on the leads. It's once we've disconnected it from our power source, we put our meter right here and we measure the resistance uh, with our multimeter. Okay, the multimeter should read close to 12 ohms. And um, the heat will make that vary a little bit, you know, because resistance impacts um, heat. I'm sorry, the, excuse me, heat. Uh, impact resistance, so it could vary, but mathematically, this is what it should be, or about what it should be. Okay, and of course, we use, we use pumps for transferring our our liquids. And just in this example, just to repeat, if we have 240 volts being applied to our pump, um, and we have and uh, it pulls 1.4 amps, we can expect the windings in this motor to have a resistance value of about 17 ohms. Okay, so that's how we mathematically calculate things. And, there, and now I want to get into power. It's one more uh, uh, term that we need to get our heads around, and that should be it for about terminology. But we're going to, uh, if power is the rating of the energy that we use, okay, how many watts something is. Uh, prime example, all right, so you've got a hairdryer. My wife's hairdryer is 1,500 watts of power. That means that. Uh, that's a measure of how much power that hair dryer is going to use when the fan is running and the heating elements heating up. Combine those two, and you're going to wind up with 1,500 watts, give or take a little bit. Uh, we also measure it in kilowatts, too. That's thousands of watts. But there's a very simple formula that we use to calculate watts, okay? And it's a triangle just like Ohm's Law. I, meaning current, okay? It could be A, or it could be I. Either one of those annotations represents current. We multiply our current by our voltage, that's the amount of power we get, okay? And I've got here on the example, uh, we have a heating element that could be in our boil kettle, mash tun, uh, HLT, whatever. And this, uh, this element uh, will consume 5,500 watts of power when we hook it to a 250 volt power source, okay? So we have the math kind of in front of us, it's 5,500 watts, that's how much power. And we know that it's going to pull 23 amps, okay, it should, and then, so we'll wind up, the, the voltage that's needed in order to pull 23 amps and get 5,500 watts is 240 volts. My point in all this is that voltage times current gives us power, okay? And you can use the triangle just like Ohm's Law, except for you're going to place the power up top, current will be down below like it was in Ohm's Law, and this time voltage will be down. Now, resistance doesn't play a factor in terms of how we're calculating power, but uh, the uh, power is, is uh, simply um, calculated through volt, uh, current times voltage, and you wind up with your expected wattage, okay, or power, okay? And so, again, uh, you know, with this one, uh, if we know the 240 volt power supply we're applying, and we have 23 amps, uh, we use an Ohm's law, we can calculate that it has 10 and a half ohms of resistance. So if I were checking that uh, element there to see if it's good or bad, I should get close to 10 and a half ohms, and I would simply take my multimeter, put it on to the, uh, to the ohms value or the ohm selection, sort of the horseshoe or the omega, whatever you want to call it, and I would simply put the leads up there on the two 
metal uh, connector points right there, and it will measure the resistance value uh, of that element. Now, that element could be, uh, it, we, we should expect to see about 10 and a half ohms. If it's high, uh, or very, very high, that means it's probably an open, it's about to break open. Um, if it's very low, it's going to be shorted, okay? And, that's, that, and that way you can use your meter to tell whether or not uh, the, uh, the element is good or bad. Okay? But this is Ohm's law, and that's how you kind of you calculate these with the voltage and, and the current as we did before. But I just kind of threw that up there as a res, as a uh, you know reviewer refresher there. Okay, all right. And <clears throat> now there are two types of voltages that we use uh, in um, the brewing, brewing systems. Okay, um, there's single phase and three phase, and we're going to talk about single phase first. This is most commonly used in our homes. There is no three phase unless you got a special application uh, like a shop out back that has a lot of uh, large equipment or something like that. But inside your actual dwelling, your living uh, residence, you know, the area you live in, you're going to have three phase, uh, I mean, excuse me, single phase voltage. And uh, in the lab, we use single phase voltage for our transfer pumps, for our heating elements, okay, um, and like a grain mill, things like that. They're all using. Uh, three uh, single phase voltage. I'll get that right. Sorry, sorry about that. Now, how do we create electricity? And I know you're thinking, man, why are we going so deep in this? You will understand shortly. And I'm not trying to make you power uh, power plant technicians or anything like that. But if you get an idea of where this voltage is coming from, it just doesn't magically appear out of the wall. It gives you an idea of what you're supposed to be working with when you're troubleshooting and trying to diagnose things, okay? So if you got a good handle on that, you can kind of understand. If you don't have a, a solid voltage that you're supposed to have, 120 volts, and it's not there, it gives you an idea of what's going on, okay? But really, to create electricity, all you need is a permanent magnet and a coil of wire, okay? And this is the illustration here. Anytime you pass that coil of wire by that magnet, or that magnet by that coil of wire, when you pass those two, uh, you induce a voltage into this coil. Now you notice this coil's got two leads right here. Well guess what? When we pass that magnet uh, in and out of this coil of wire, it's inducing a voltage into that coil of wire. We could hook our conductors, remember the wires? We could hook our wire right here, put a light bulb right there, and right back here into the coil. That completes the circuit, and as we move our, our magnet in and out of this coil of wire, we're going to be inducing a voltage, and you'll see the light kind of us pulsing as we move through it. It'll light up because we are inducing a voltage in that coil. It's connected to our circuit. It leaves home and it comes back. Okay, so it's all starting to kind of come back together. So that's how voltage is created. Okay, um, we this is a very simplistic view uh, of, that I've got here. This graphic here, and what it is, it's got a, you have a coil of wire that is rotating in between a north and a south permanent magnet, okay? And what it's doing as it goes lays flat, it is um, it's the, uh, it's breaking lines of flux, magnetic flux between these two poles. And when it does that, when it's laying flat at 90 degrees and it is in the path, breaking the, the path of the lines of flux in that magnetic field, it induces the highest amount of voltage. Now, when it's laying up like this, the Magnetic lines of flux are passing through that hole right there, so to speak, and it is it's, it's creating the least amount or zero voltage and when it's in that position. Now, I'll show you, and you'll notice though, you've got this turning, and this is a complete circuit, okay? It's going all the way back. All right, and that's how, and this, this is the very, very, very simplistic way, the way these power plants work that you see, you know, when you get the big smokestacks I showed you in one of the previous videos. Okay, that's, this is exactly how they're creating power. Now, they have much, much larger units, and they don't use these giant permanent magnets. They create a magnetic field with coils of wire to go in with this coil of wire. So it's because it's much more practical than having huge, gigantic permanent magnets, okay? So but the, the concept is still the same. You have a magnetic field between those coils, and this coil, or this rotor is turning here, and every time, it, every uh, 180 degrees laying flat, it induces a voltage. Okay, and here's and you can see a little meter right here. We were using the uh, lamp as, as our earlier uh, indicator that we have current. But notice it's running between these two magnet, uh, magnetic fields, and we, we induce a voltage. Okay, and the uh, the direction of the current depends on which magnet is lined up with, or which magnetic field is lined up with this rotor. Okay, um, that's the same thing. And again, this is where we get alternating current. 
Okay, this is why it goes positive to negative. Remember our little sine wave uh, symbol for AC? It did that number there. Okay, that's why it peaks like this uh, and then goes down to negative. It's alternating between uh, positive and negative. That's why we call it alternating current. Remember, DC with batteries, straight current, there is no alternating. Okay, it doesn't use this to create power, it uses chemical energy. Remember that chemical reaction. This uses mechanical uh, motion here, and so you get a, an alternating current, which is what we have in our homes. Now here's a graph here that kind of shows you the phase uh, that, that, that the, uh, where these uh, peaks and these uh, valleys come from this alternating current. So when our, uh, when our rotor is sitting here, our, our, our coil of wire is right here um, in position here, you'll notice these magnetic lines of flux are passing straight through the coil here, okay? Now, they're breaking the least amount of uh, magnetic lines of flux or the field, okay? So we have no voltage, okay, because it's kind of just, just kind of passing right through. Now, as we rotate this, and this is being rotated by, in, in terms of um, our power plants, these big, uh, these big uh, steam turbines spin, they create steam and it runs across the turbines and it spins these rotors. That's what's causing this rotation. We're not sitting here cranking on it or anything like that, but they, they provide a power that rotates these uh, these uh, uh, coils of wire at a certain speed. So what, what we do is when, it, when it's turned over, it's turned over very, very fast. It's rotating very fast. But when that passes through and the, mo and the coils of wire are breaking the most lines of flux, that's when our voltage is at its peak. So we've, we're sitting here at the one, we'll call it the, uh, the uh, zero degree. It stands straight up and down, there's zero voltage. As it lays more into these lines of flux, our voltage starts to come up. And then finally, when it gets to the 90 degree uh, point, that's when we're at our maximum, uh, breaking those lines of flux, flux in, in inducing uh, a voltage in the coil, okay? So we're peaking our voltage. Now, as it rotates, and it never stops rotating, okay? So as it rotates further out of that direct path of the uh, lines of flux, it will start to diminish and, go, and drop off, okay? And then we are back to the same position, except for it's 180 degrees out, and we are now back at zero. So it continues to rotate into our 270 as it, as it comes out and comes more and more in line with the lines of flux from the magnetic field. It starts to peak the voltage. It starts to increase the voltage, except for it increases the negative voltage. Okay, so everything below this line is negative. Everything above it is positive. And we continue to rotate till we're in full alignment with those uh, magnetic lines of flux. And then as we rotate out and going back to basically these, the original position, we're going to wind up on zero, okay? And this is what AC voltage is doing. This is alternating current. This is what is in our homes. So when we, met, when we measure that with our meter and we plug it into our uh, outlet, you'll see what it's, what it's doing is measuring this positive and, and negative. And it's doing it so quickly, our meter's not going to determine positive, negative, positive, negative. It can't pick up that fast, okay? And this is happening. The speed at which this rotor is turning right here, the coil, the coil of wire, this is happening 60 times a second, okay? So that is one cycle of a single phase of voltage. And here's a, here's a this is, the, this is the coil of wire right here, or the mass the magnetic field. You can also turn the magnetic field by a coil of wire, which is typically what's done out of the power generation plant. So you turn a magnetic field by a coil, and every time it passes by that coil, and it's got the full strength, then you get a voltage that comes out of this coil, okay? So you have, this is a single uh, phase of voltage, all right? Now, if we add two more coils here, 120 electrical degrees apart, okay, that's critical. If we add two more coils, then every time this, uh, this uh, rotating magnetic field passes by this coil, it's going to create a voltage, and it's going to create another one when it passes through here. So it's going to create three peaks of voltage in one cycle, and that's where we get three phases of voltage, okay? So um, we're going to use the black one here, which I'm really glad we can see as far as uh, color. Uh, as this, uh, as this uh, magnetic uh, field comes by and lines itself up with L1, we are, uh, this is a coil of wire, it's just simply a coil of wire. 
we have a peak voltage, or we, the, the peak voltage is coming out when it's perfectly aligned with that coil. And our voltage can be hooked to a load, okay, with conductors. It's a very simplistic uh, example, but it will pass by there and it will create a voltage. And this is represented by the black line because this is the black coil, okay? Now, as it rotates away from the L1, it starts to diminish to the point where it, when it's about right there, you're going to see pretty much nothing on L1. But as it's rotating, it's starting to come into uh, the path of the L2 coil. It's starting to get closer, and we start seeing our L2 coil increase until that magnet, magnet is perfectly aligned with this coil. It's passing by there, and at that point where it's perfectly aligned in the passing is where that peak voltage will happen. So now we've peaked a second phase of our voltage, and as it rotates and moves away from that coil, it does the same thing the black one did, and it drops down to zero. Okay? Now, we're finally rolling around into our third coil of wire, and you know, this one created a voltage just like this one did. Okay? And we're rolling around, and we finally align with L3, which is sort of the orange one, and when we're in perfect alignment, we have a peak voltage on L3. And then it repeats itself, and we have L1 coming back up, and so on and so forth. And they also have the negative voltage. It goes around 180 degrees uh, where this magnet, uh, the south pole will line up that, and we wind up with our negative side. But that's how three-phase three -phase voltage is created, and it's real important to know where it comes from because you, you might wind up in a three-phase system where you're missing a leg. Okay, so you need to know you're not going to go back to power plant. Chances are it's not in the power plant's uh, problem. But knowing where this voltage is coming from, uh, knowing where it's created, how it's created, and what you can expect to see when you put a meter into a three-phase uh, power source. You know, you, you, you've got a plug or something like that um, uh, that you need to check or a disconnect or something. Check to see if you've got all three phases because your system has to have all three phases to run if it's a three-phase system. If it's a single phase system, it only needs one. And that's how the generator, the power plants provide you single phase voltage as well. Um, it's a little more complicated with some transformers and things like that, but basically what you're doing is you're using one leg off of that three phase, trans, uh, three phase power source, okay? But that is three phase voltage and single phase, and that's how they're both created, okay? Um, the power coming out of the power plant is actually three phase voltage. And they send that three phase through those big, tall, you know, towers going down the highway, those transmission lines we talked about with the aluminum conductors and things. Sends it down those, and then we will tap into it in our in our uh, neighborhoods and things like that. We'll, we'll peel off a, um, some a leg of that voltage, and we'll have uh, our single phase voltage going into our house as a, as a result of the three phase being created at the power plant. So that's sort of how it all comes together in terms of where our power comes from, and that's that's this is very important because you need to know the difference between single phase and three phase, and just not, well, I got three phase. What does that mean? I don't know. You know, that, that's not going to work, okay? So, anyway, <clears throat> we'll get into measuring three phase voltage, uh, and I know that our friends at Hopkinsville Brewing Company have a three phase um, uh, system that runs their boiler. So, it uses all three phases to for the heating elements uh, to, uh, to, to turn the water into steam, okay, that they use for their boiler, all right? Uh, so th that's where it's applicable in a brewery application. But uh, just, just this is just a little uh, animated graphic that you can see as the North Pole passes through. Well, we'll, we'll start with the A one right here. As the North passes through the A, it peaks. As it passes through the, the uh, other side, it goes to the peak to the negative. And these are these are sets of coils that uh, that are 120 degrees apart. So this is a set of this is your A coils. And this is your B coils, and this is your C coils. They're 120 degrees apart. So the the uh, the difference in the phases is 120 degrees. But this is how they all peak and work together. Uh, they're never peaking at the same time. They're always 120 degrees out from each other. Okay. Um, I think that's about all I have for you as far as this part of the lecture. Between the three, we've talked about the terminology, the very very fundamentals. We've even talked about how voltage is created. So now you've got an idea of what goes on in a power plant, okay? And I might even have some uh, more graphics for you as well to watch uh, for, for as far as hydropower, uh, coal-fired po uh, coal power plants, nuclear-powered uh, power plants.
plants and you know things like that. But uh, I'll see if I can dig those up and, and I'll post them up on Blackboard. But that's an idea of, that, I mean, we've covered a lot of material, you know, the fundamentals. Uh, from the very, very beginning when we were talking about uh, water molecules flowing through a water hose and using those analogy to now we understand where three-phase and single-phase voltage comes from. If you have any questions about this, or something like this is just not, is it, if it's fuzzy or you're clueless, that's okay. Get a hold of me and then I will explain, through, uh, explain it to you. We'll go through it and we'll make sure you understand it before we move on. But for right now, that's what I've got and uh, I hope you understand it and I appreciate you watching this. And again, reach out if you've got any questions at all. Thank you so much.